Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Winning Now, Leading in a VUCA World. This session is hosted by the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Chicago in partnership with the Chicago Booth School of Business, FinTechs, and the UK Department for International Trade. We have a great group of speakers, and I am excited to welcome Greg Bunch, Adjunct Professor of Entrepreneurship at Chicago Booth, Maria Scott, Founder and CEO of TANA, and our moderator, Randy Rivera, Executive Director of FinTechs. I will now go ahead and hand it over to Randy to kick us off. Well, good morning, everyone in Chicago, where I am. I am very excited today uh, to be participating and moderating this discussion that we're going to have. Um, it's 9 a.m. in Chicago. Uh, we have uh, Maria coming from London, uh, where it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, Charisse is kind enough. Charisse, who's, who's kind enough to introduce us, is coming from Hong Kong at 10 o'clock p.m. Um, and we have oh, we had over 300 registrants for this webinar. So obviously, the topic and the conversation is one that is interesting to the community. Um, but this is really a testament to the great uh, the strength of our international network at Booth. And as an alum, I must admit that I'm a little biased um, and probably a little more excited because I get to um, speak to both a professor and a fellow alum of the school. But it really is exciting and motivating to see our community come together during these times, which is what we tend to do. Makes me a proud alum. Um, we are going to go into some housekeeping notes. I'm not going to go into bios. We were kind enough to share those with all of you beforehand. Um, I could not. I could spend an hour here each just going on through the successes and the accolades that we can talk about with Greg and Maria. But um, we really want to get into uh, what's brought us here today, which is uh, winning now and leading in a VUCA world. Uh, VUCA, for those of you that don't know, stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times. Um, so a few, few other housekeeping matters. This is not an economic update. Um, I know that the prowess of our faculty and, and student body and alums um, leads us to always want to guide the conversation that way. But today, um, we're gonna be focused on strategy, not economics. Um, your phones will be muted, but that does not mean we're gonna ask you to stop engaging. We are consistently monitoring uh, monitoring and asking for questions throughout the session. So feel free to use the question the Q and A um, tab to ask away. And we will try to get to as many of your questions that you have today. Um, our aim in terms of the structure of the conversation is to have a moderated discussion for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then really open it up so that we can get our hands dirty into some of the some topics that you guys wanna cover. So with that said, let's get to it. Uh, first and foremost, thanks, Greg and Maria. Welcome to uh, our, this discussion. Uh, Greg, you're joining us from Michigan and Maria from London. So um, sunny, uh, it seems to be sunny, at least everywhere I'm seeing right now. But let me um, start with the stats. Uh, worldwide, this pandemic, the coronavirus, has affected over 5.5 million people. Um, we've seen over 350,000 deaths across the world. And in the United States, we have a lion's share of that, um, of, of the impact of, of that disease with over 1.7 million infected. And then this morning, USA Today did a cover that this today is actually the day that marks the, mo the moment where we'll pass 100,000 deaths in the United States, which is really uh, tragic and, and, and quite candidly, something that none of us really imagined during, to, to happen during our lifetime. Um, in Chicago and Cook County, we are quickly seeing, thankfully enough, so, some sort of plateau. But all of this creates a lot of anxiety and fear. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Greg, you teach um, entrepreneurs and business leaders um, a lot around how to defend and grow your organization during these times. You have a unique perspective as a former founder, now academic and advisor to a lot of these companies and leaders. As leaders revisit their uh, revisit and reframe their strategies. What should be top of mind? What do you think? Andy, thanks for the question. And thanks to each one of you for uh, logging in from all around the world. You're very important to us, former alumni, prospective students, and friends of the community. And especially in a time like this that is so volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, Randy, as you know, that language comes from the military to describe what goes on in the middle of a battle. It's easy to plan your strategy um, in the cool of the day, but when, when the guns start firing, plans go out the window. 
And this is when entrepreneurs and strategists really step forward because people who are always thinking about making bets into the future are able to respond to this kind of situation. People who are great managers who optimize and make things efficient in steady state conditions are often caught flat footed. And even if an entrepreneur is caught flat footed, she's very quick to think, what's the opportunity? How do I defend? And as soon as she's got a position defended, how does she begin to move forward? How does she get greater opportunity? So that's what we are gonna focus on today. First of all, what do we still need to defend against? But really, how do we win going forward? Because we don't wanna play defense all the time. Um, I, I've written an article recently in Chicago Booth Review with Major Tom Gaines, US Army. And he has a great phrase. He says, America has never been a great first quarter team. So if you know U.S. football or U.S. basketball, it's often in the last minutes of a game that things are decided. Um, and I think many of us are not great first quarter people. COVID punched us in the face. Now the question is, how do we get up and how do we win? So that's what we're going to focus on today. And I think Maria is going to bring some great domain expertise to that as well. I don't know about domain expertise, Greg, um, but I'm certainly a very, very proud alum, just like Randy is, and I'm just so delighted. It feels incredibly special to be able to connect with our community. Um, I, I think you're exactly right. It's never been as important as it is now. Um, you know, as I've been reflecting on this, and it's, it's, it's interesting to think about the title of our um, session today, um, VUCA. You know, the thing is, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's our everyday, right, for startups. Um, and so, uh, you know, as I reflect on the difference between um, going through a crisis back in my, um, you know, in the previous life and now, uh, it couldn't be more different. You know, I think that sense of being in control and seeing opportunities in every change, you're exactly right, Greg. You know, every change we see, every um, landscape shift around us is an opportunity for us, you know, um, and stakes are much higher, no, no question about it, and the risks are, are a lot greater, but the rewards are too, and we are in charge at the end of the day we make our own destiny I think that's that's the key and that's the really exhilarating thing about it well it's interesting because would you both comments um, tend to point to a change in the age and you know one of the things that we've talked about in anticipation of this conversation is that it seems to be that the skill set uh, necessary to survive is changing um, and that seems to be the change of the times and uh it strikes me more that a lot of the things that we're looking for in leaders and, and, and teammates and collaborators and partners um, are characteristics a lot more in the entrepreneurial side of the spectrum as opposed to the large corporate side. So Greg, I mean, would you say, is it the age of the entrepreneur? Um, I mean, I, I'll, um, this morning I was listening to Jerry Seinfeld comment on the last dance um, so very interesting contrasting perspectives. Um, but one of the things that he said is there's a big focus in business around will and the will to win. And he said that if you look at some of the best leaders or some of the best, um, you know, out, most outstanding in their field, it's this love for what they do that drives them because the love is endless. The will can end. Um, that just seems to me very entrepreneurial. So is it, is it the age of the entrepreneur, Greg? I'd love to get your thoughts. And Maria, obviously, you made the change, so I'd love to hear yours as well. Yeah, so, so the short answer is I think it's a, it's a barbell age, that it's an age where obviously the oligopolies and monopolies, the, the, the Alibabas and the Googles are going to really have great power because they've got huge balance sheets. They can win by crushing their opponents. And that's just going to get more so. The other people I think have the greatest opportunity, though, are the entrepreneurs. Sometimes I call them the ankle biters, like those little dogs that are down there biting at your ankle. Because they're laser focused. Their, their team is focused. They have one product or a very small product set. They can be like David fighting against Goliath. The, to succeed as an entrepreneur, it's not just will. It's thinking. And good entrepreneurs outthink because they can't. They can't outgun. They don't have enough cash reserves to do it. Um, and, and so 
I really see this is the, the, the rise of what I'd call the scrappy thinker. In fact, everyone who logs into this, we're going to send you a poster that was put out by a friend of mine, David Hyatt. He's a British entrepreneur. If you're in London, you may know him. He, um, he's the founder of, of Hyatt Denim, and so his genes have become popular worldwide. He also is the founder, co-founder of the Do Lectures. But he and I put out a poster last week um, called the Scrappy. And, and I think that this is the age for the resilient and the scrappy, but it's not enough to just be scrappy a fighter. You've got to be a smart fighter. Uh, if, you, if you just go into a fight and you're, and you're the small guy, you get beat. If you go into the, the fight and you're David against Goliath, you outthink the big lumbering giant, you can win. So I'm really excited for the small. I, I'm actually really concerned for the middle companies right now. The middle companies, I think, Randy, they, they can never be big. And so I think the challenge for them, and it's going to be hard for their managers, they've got to think small. They need to skinny down now. They need to get rid of product lines or stop giving fuel to them. They've got to think like entrepreneurs. I, I think this is the age of the entrepreneur. I think we're all entrepreneurs now if we want to survive, except for the few oligopolists. Maria, what are your thoughts that's, on that? Uh, I mean, that, that's really, really true. And I just, I'd love to echo a few things you said, Randy, actually, about love and um, that sense of um, passion and the place the founders come from. Um, you know, do you remember that book, Founders Mentality? Mm -hmm. I think it's really, it's not necessarily, I mean, I'm, Greg is much more scientific about it and academic, and I can never have the breadth of his knowledge um my my instinct is that it's not necessarily about where we are um how big or small companies but what's here you know that sense of ownership that sense of love you know the founder mentality what is it all about it's sense of ownership and love really deep love and passion for what we do and it's just like you said greg that sees through everything that brings discipline discipline around how you do it taking care of your clients really passionately because we really love them you know we really care so deeply about what we do and that i think will see through uh, those companies that really really are committed uh, to what they do and to solving the problem they're focusing on and uh, and also their clients at the end of the day they are the ones that will um you know uh, see the see us through everything so Maria, this is this is really interesting, and I, I I love the approach that you take. I know that you know how committed you are to both the, the the loving the work you do, but also investing in the people and the both people that work you work with and the clients that you have. However, you know I I want to draw kind of something a little bit uh, a topic that is probably tougher to deal with in concepts of love. These times are times to skinny down, and I know that um, you think about as an executive, you got to focus on cash. Cash is king. A lot of you know everything you read about what companies yeah. are going to survive is is that he who or she who had more cash in January will be um, will have an edge. Not maybe not win, but will have an edge. Um, yeah. And then yeah. in the in the in the pursuit of cash, we compromise control. And yeah. so, how do you go through that? I mean. Um, love is what drives us. Maybe that's the fuel for some for entrepreneurs, for Pat, for founders. Um, but we do bump up against realities, um, hard realities, hard truths. As someone who's in the driver's seat of a company that you helped create, how do you manage those two, that tension between the desire for everyone to win, but the practical reality um, that there are some hard choices to be made? You know, it's excruciating. I mean, you're you're exactly right. It's excruciating, and there is no there is no one easy answer. Um, I think, on the whole, um, founders uh, are uh, really disciplined about hiring people, hiring talent, and making sure that the talent they bring on board is multi-talented so they can do many different things and um, I swear by each and every one of our team, and we do not foresee whatever happens to the economy, letting go of any single one of them because they are genuinely so multi-talented and they can re be repurposed for so many different things no matter what happens. And they're so dedicated and hardworking. Um, but also with investors, I mean, this is a really hard one, right? Um, uh, and I think you're right. If you don't have to raise right now, um, you probably 
shouldn't. <laughs> it's a really tough environment to be raised in. We are just closing our round. Um, we've been incredibly lucky. Um, but, but, but would I recommend raising this environment? You're exactly right. No, because you have less choice and the more choice you have, the better. Um, and I guess when you are choosing your investors, and that is such a difficult decision, you know, um, everybody says it, but I think uh, you really have to go through it and really feel it in your bones. Um, a bad choice here can be debilitating. Um, in the ideal world, they will have gone through a similar journey. They will have built a business. And so they know what it's like to feel it here and to really passionately mm -hmm. believe in what you do and have that experience of building something really big. And if they haven't, um, they have supported people who've gone through it really consistently. Um, and one little tip I would really highly recommend um, is actually speaking with other portfolio companies. You know, it's entirely fine um, interviewing other founders who have been supported by this investor. Founder to founder is always a very honest conversation. You cannot go wrong. It's a really 10 minute, very well spent. Yeah, so I agree with that very much, especially the part about, well, all of it, but the part about the peers talking to peers. Randy, let me challenge an assumption, though, that we need to have outside money or significant outside money. So obviously, I teach a lot about venture capital. Last week in class, I have one of my former students. She's fabulous. Kat Wilhelm, she's a general partner at IVP Venture Capital out in the Bay which by the way makes her very rare. I still think, I think that still less than 10% of general partners in VC firms are women. Uh, CAC is a fabulous venture capitalist and IVP is a high quality firm. That said, I think we are pushing too many people to get institutional money when we really should push people to have sustainable businesses. And, and, and of course I care about ecologically sustainable, but I mean a business that can be sustained with its own cash flows from its own customers. I don't think we teach enough of that in the business schools. And um, so I've begun to teach more of it. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. One is Basecamp, Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. They've also written Rework, Recode. It doesn't have to be crazy at work. Um, they've taken essentially no outside money and have developed a fabulous business. Another one is, uh, I mentioned David Hyatt, taken very little outside money, a very great business. And then there's this couple in, in London right now, uh, Hugh and Becky, they've started a jacket company called Painter Jacket, P-A-Y-N-T-E-R jacket.com. And on Saturday at 9 a.m. BST, they're gonna have a sale and all the proceeds of the sale of their jackets go to support charities related to the NHS. They've built a micro business that is just fabulous. So. One of the things I'm really challenging my students to do is say, can we build a business that's sustainable even if we don't get outside money? Now, obviously, if you're gonna take something global, it's almost impossible to scale a company global, but there's some fabulous lifestyle. And, and we call them lifestyle almost derogatorily, but by lifestyle, I mean businesses that throw off to owners millions of pounds, millions of dollars a year. Um, so, so I think that we, what we really need to focus on is not funding. We need to focus on solving human needs and getting customers to pay for it. To me, the beauty of business is to um, create a good or service that somebody wants and they'll pay you more for it than it costs you to make it. It's just that simple. Instead of focusing on how do we get a venture capital to fund us, focus on how do you get a customer to pay you. Um, so, but if you're going to get outside point. money, if you're going to get outside money, you absolutely have to do really good due diligence on the investor and not only the investor historically, but the investor in the bad times. There's a lot of vulture capitalists that circle around entrepreneurs in bad times. Yeah. That's no, I couldn't agree more. I spent, you know, again, 17 years of my career in the financial services space. Um, most of that time as a lender or running a lending business. And I think that is, it is, and it has been in vogue to go raise big rounds, but the reality of it is that if you can get away with it, it's just a more, a better, it's a better process to run that business as a sustainable business on its own without having other cooks um, and other agendas affecting your strategy. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have uh, 
for, for you, Greg, and then Maria, would really welcome your perspective on this comment that Greg made during our prep. He said, entrepreneurs should not be reading the Wall Street Journal right now. Um, so Greg, maybe you can give us some context. And then Maria, as an entrepreneur, if you're not reading the journal, which knowing you, you're an overachiever, you probably are, what else are you reading? Um, but Greg, let's uh, turn, curious right. to the So Randy, we like sound bites. And so the sound bite is, if you're an entrepreneur, you shouldn't be reading the Wall Street Journal. But let me tell you this morning, what I already read in the first few minutes when I woke up, I wrote, read New York Times deal book. I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the Financial Times. I read the South China Morning um, Press. I read the, uh, the um, Axios Pro Rata. So I read a whole just raft of generic stuff. I went on Becker Friedman because Becker Friedman is our great data center for economic data. So I read all of that. The reason I say you shouldn't be reading the Wall Street Journal is what you will get there is generic data. Generic data gets you generic strategy. As an entrepreneur, we need very specific data, specific to what is my customer experiencing right now? What's changed with my customer's need right now? What's changed with my supplier right now? And that requires collecting um, primary source data. You've got to be closer than ever to your customer. You've got to be closer than ever to your, your uh, supplier and supply chain. You've got to be closer than ever to your regulator. So let me be clear. I believe in reading all of that stuff, but that won't give you the edge. The edge you need as an entrepreneur is a very small piece of data. that We often say, I know you took Professor Schrager's class, and he talks about uh, three skills of the uh, strategist. He talks about Superman, uh, Lieutenant Columbo, and Tinkerbell. Now, I've changed the Lieutenant Columbo because most people your age have never heard of him. So I call it Superman, Sherlock Holmes, and Tinkerbell. The skill of Sherlock Holmes is he goes out and finds very, very concrete, granular data. He goes to the scene of the crime and he looks at some little hair on a jacket. If, if you saw the recent, uh, uh, well, it's not so recent anymore, the Cumberbatch version, and they would show him like sorting through all this random data on the screen, and you'd see a little hair. That's what the best entrepreneurs are doing. They're like Sherlock Holmes. They're going out looking for that little bitty thing that nobody else sees that has huge implications. But So I, I'm not actively starting a company right now. I'm advising a lot. Someone like Maria, who's in the trenches, I bet she's looking at very specific data. And it would be interesting. What, what do you look at right now, Maria? That's so true. That's so true. You know, um, there's so much data out there and it is really distracting and you have to be focused. You said something really key, Greg, which is we absolutely have to be focused. And the thing we have to be focused in, on is our clients and our clients' needs. And so I read um, relatively geeky stuff, which is what my clients read. It's all about the technical niche that we're in, um, compliance risks, you know, operational efficiencies. I read a lot of that and I'm just following, you know, a lot of that's going on, customer experience. So it's relatively specialized but that's what my clients care about. So I read that. Um, I rely on my investors and I guess that's where um, institutional investors can be, can, institutional and professional investors can be really, really helpful. Things like our currency risk, you know, we, if we're running currency risk, what are we doing? Where should we place our money? And I, I really rely on my investors to tell me that rather than, you know, trying to guess what is happening in the macro environment. Um, they're incredibly good at that. So, um, and then the other thing I read, and that's kind of like, I listen to those things rather than read them is, you know, just at the moment, I'm reading a lot about overcoming adversity just to help our guys. Cause obviously a lot of our team are losing, you know, family members. This is a tragic time, right? For everybody, there's, there's just, I mean, there's no hiding um, um, that. And I'm reading things like anti-fragile and obstacle is the way, and, you know, just anything that is essentially strengthening us from, you know, the core of which, we really need to stay tighter together as a team because this is really hard, right? This is not just an economic crisis. This is a human, human catastrophe and going through it together. That's kind of, those are the two things I focus on at the moment. That's all really good stuff, Maria. Um, I'm starting to, I want to remind everyone we're about halfway through the webinar. We're still taking questions and we've got a couple that have come through. I'm going to uh, massage some of these together just to be efficient with time. Um, but Maria, 
you know, in the planning of your business, as you've looked to design a business plan and strategy to, to, to compete, you obviously are finishing around, you've done well um, in the middle of, of, I would say, an exciting time for your business. But how do you, as executive of the company, um, cook in advantages? And we don't need to trade secrets, but from what are the th- two to three things that you've done differently at? Diana, that 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 are that make you stand out amongst either your competition, um, but then also, in terms of helping you create a process that positions you with the right information to make decisions around things like where are you going to spend the cash? Um, how do you how do you, what's your mindset? What's your approach toward those two issues? You know, how do you create a, the strategy that gives you competitive advantage, but then also tools you with the information that you need to make the most thoughtful decisions for your business. Absolutely. Um, so to the first part of your question, Randy, um, so we are a startup, we're a young company in a very conservative environment. So our typical client base is top tier global, some of the largest financial institutions in the world, some of the largest um, fund administrators um, in the world. So these are institutions who have used, who are used to relying on very, very large software companies. And so when we pitch up next to those, they're looking for something really, really special from us Um, and so for us to compete in that environment we have ten we have had to do three things essentially one is focus on things that are really really difficult to do like they're really from a technology perspective very difficult to do you have to be absolutely committed and focused and really spend a lot of time and energy on on that and as a small company we're very well placed to do that you know working with academics and our own computer scientists so it has to be very difficult uh, so it's not dif- it's it's not something that somebody can just come in and build themselves or copy um in, in within a year um the second thing is is just really caring very deeply um, about our clients and one of the things customers keep telling us from continuously is that they feel very differently working with us than anybody else they've worked with before because every single member of the team really cares you know they are out there in front of before the client even can think of what they need they are it's there already in front of them as options and you know we are executing very quickly so that care and another thing is just focus and being really boring and focusing and focusing and focusing really deeply and really narrowly on the things that our clients really really need um um, so those are the three things. And as a startup, we have to be a hundred times better than our next competitor to win any single contract in this environment. You know, um, a top tier financial institution wouldn't even consider us unless we were all those things. Um, and then how do we do it? Um, to be honest, the only magic answer I, I have to that, and maybe there are, and Greg probably will have many, many smart answers. Uh, for me, it's really just talking to many, many clients, just continuously talking to them and just listening what it is they're most um, unhappy about. And uh, if we often, we often, we just say, hey, if you were imagine no limitations, there's no limitations, money or otherwise, or people, how would you do it? How would it work? And um, we have a lot of those conversations all the time and we're continuously doing that as we expand the platform from one regulation to another to another. Um, Many of those regulations I'm no longer an expert in, but we're continuously covering those and really just listening to many, 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 many people in the industry. That's that's the only thing I have found to help. I hear the theme of empathy there, Greg. I hear a lot of empathy theme and um, it reminds me of a book. (laughs) A good friend of mine wrote called Applied Empathy, where he really focuses on that as an executive. But Greg, um, again, you've seen all sorts of business models. Would love to you to add some color as well here. Yeah, so let me um, hold that question for a minute and talk a little about the funding environment going on um, and comparing it to 2008, 2009. I saw a specific question about that, but a lot of us are asking that question. So first of all, at least in the U.S., the Fed has infused so much liquidity into the system that things didn't lock up like they did in 2008, 2009. And second, there is so much capital still at play in the large institutional investors, the the venture funds, that they're still writing term sheets. Um, I I know, again, back to Keck Wilhelm on Thursday, her company is 40 years old, very conservative, normally comes in in the later stages. She said, and I don't think this is out of school at all, they just issued their first term sheet ever in the history of the company, having never met the founders except by Zoom. 
So there's a desire to deploy capital and, and, and capital hasn't locked up like it did 10 years ago in, in terms of investing. The second thing is, and this is very European specific, a guy named Phil uh, Wickson, uh, Wicken, I, I can't pronounce his name, I'm sorry. It's, uh, yeah, Phil Wickinson um, put together a, um, an open source sheet that is about 500 investors, mostly investing in Europe. I can, we can put a link to that in the follow-up. But what it is, is it's crowdsourced from entrepreneurs talking about the deals they're in. And I think that this goes back to something Maria said that's so important. This is a time for entrepreneurs to talk to entrepreneurs because you have great power right now. The investors are in zero uh, rate environments and negative rate environments. They need you more than ever. Um, the person who wins every negotiation is the person with the most power or perceived power. If you don't have cash right now, you think you're weak. But the thing you have is energy and an idea that can really lever an investor's money. Where are they going to go to get the kind of returns they can get from you? But you need to talk with each other and say, hey, who's really writing good term sheets now? Who is open for business? Who's not open for business? And, and we can put that, um, that spreadsheet into, into the follow-up notes. Um, so go ahead and ask another question though, Randy. I think I might have gotten you off track, but I'm really focused on this practical tip about if you need outside money, is it available and where do you get it? And how do you assess it? Like to Maria's point, you know, how do you assess it? Right. So, so I think that's a great point, Greg. But if you look, and I think one of the things that I would add to the conversation is if you look at the funding cycles of post-2008, um, any significant crisis that we've had over the course of the last, um, over the course of our, our, our the history that we know, um, and particularly, but particularly in the last 20 years, uh, you'll see that there's a small pause yeah, just yeah, to absolutely. recalibrate, to test, to see, make sure that you did make the right choices or identify where you may have to make changes in personnel and leadership. But we have not seen a stop. And um, I also would say that from a capital perspective, I have to reiterate your point. There's so much dry powder looking for opportunities right now. Um, now, there really was crazy. a short pause. I mean, of course, when, right. around March 15 to the early, the latter half of March, people took a deep breath. But people dived back in because I, I see a question down here about, like, how do you think that COVID is going to affect the investor community? The investors are desperate for ideas that turn into money right now. So if they can see that you have a good strategy with a good business model, um, not one of these just, so I love my MBAs, but, but there's a word that a lot of us entrepreneurs have, and it's called the MBA startup. And the MBA startup is we sit around in class, we make up an idea and it, we fall in love with it. The best startups come, and, 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 and I teach this in class, the best startups come from an entrepreneur who wants to solve a problem and has the chops to do it, has the ability to do it. So if, if you really have background in a space and you can put a team together, investors are almost desperate right now to fund you. Um, but if you're just coming, if you're just a fortune hunter or you're just like, hey, let's get rich today, let's, let's make up an idea, your idea better be really good. Right, and that's, that's tough. Maria, one of the the question that's come up, and again, I think that this is apt for you because it's something that it's clear to me is a value you care about or something and a value that you hold dear um, to your design of your company is, but how do you keep your employees motivated? And maybe uh, more broadly, when you think about managing talent in this environment, um, what are the conversations that you find yourself having now that maybe you didn't have two, three years ago, or maybe even when you, you, you didn't think you would be having with your employees to keep them engaged and make sure that they're their activities and um, their goals are aligned with yours and the organizations? You know, one of my learnings from this period has been, you know, the greatness of human nature is just infinite. To be honest, um, they motivate me, you know, They're on a daily basis. I'm finding myself, myself in, com in conversations with you know, um, every single member of my team who actually continuously motivates me. I think the, the thing about it is being honest with your team means that they really understand 
uh, what's going on. And when they really understand, they come up with these amazing ideas because they know we are on a mission. They know we're here to do something really great, to change the world. And we're going to do this together, you know. Um, and then the things that have been happening during uh, this horrible time when, you know, um, members of the family pass away and they are there, you know, doing something critical, deploying a client literally the same night. I mean, things like that, they're just unbelievably heroic um, that I never imagined, like, nobody go through, let alone my team, you know, and people are doing this just because they really, really care. Um, so in all honesty, they motivate me. Um, I think the mission motivates all of us combined. Um, and I think our strength is, is really in being honest and supportive and continuously supportive of each other and just realizing we are in a very small boat in a very big ocean. The ocean is going crazy, but guess what? We have each other and we're all rowing in the same direction. And so, you know what, together we have a really good chance of getting there and we are. Um, so well, yeah, I want to come work like for you. I, want to come I, know, right? I don't think so, Greg. No, I, I was... so here's, here's the reason. I mean this kind of seriously. Obviously, I don't, I'm not going to apply for a job there. But here's the deal. Too many business leaders today see humans as a cost. Oh, God, and yeah. A human, a human, I believe, is the greatest asset in your business. Yes. If you unlock the asset of the human mind, yeah. you can do amazing things. If you see your people as a cost, when things get tight, all you do is you cut off the bottom 35% or whatever you think you have to cut off, and you just cut off all this asset. So I think you have a very enlightened mind and, and, and one that's going to be more valuable because we're in a universe now that what wins is minds. Human, you know, minds design algorithms. Minds design, until the algorithm designs the algorithm better than we do. Um, Hey, we Greg, definitely haven't figured it all out. We definitely haven't figured it out, Greg. I think I, I genuinely do think I'm really, really lucky. I have a very experienced team and um, and and they get it. And also being honest and vulnerable with each other, I think really helps. Um, and just genuinely, gen, genuinely caring for each other, you know, um, that's really it. I, I have not figured it out. All I know is people are amazing and through this time they really show their greatness you know even even more so than ever randy i noticed there's a question here about uh startups worried about their cash burn what should they be right. focusing on so i want to start with a, being a teacher and do a corrective cash doesn't burn we spend money every dollar you spend is a decision you make it's a vote and once you get in mind I'm making a decision to spend money, you think about it. When you say cash is burning, that's a passive concept. And as a teacher of entrepreneurs, I just wanna like give you some cold water in the face and say, no, cash isn't burning, you're spending it. So now, as you're spending it, the question is, um, what do I need to spend my money on today that would get me the best return so I survive and the best return to get to the mission accomplishment? So I really want to reorganize them. I can't, I know that people talk this way, but I would tell you if students say to me in my class, what's my burn rate? I want to say to them, and I do say to them, no, what's your spend rate? What have you chosen to invest in? And what have you chosen not to invest in? So um, I, I think you need to invest that's in hard, Greg. invested. What's that? And that's hard, Greg, because the reality is the CEOs are not necessarily always keeping track of what they didn't do. And sometimes you have such a bias towards what you did that you end up spending more time defending it right, than right. looking through and reassessing and giving yourself an honest review of the decisions that the company made. I think that entrepreneurs can be brutally honest sometimes to a fault, but also once they, this is um, the importance of systematically reminding yourself of the choices you made can give you tremendous opportunity to reflect. Well, you know what? It's very freeing and it's the way a successful, entrepreneurs are scrappy and they, and they take nothing and make something. They're like the stone soup parable. They have very little and they charm things till it happens. And managers of large concerns are used to big budgets and they don't have to be as efficient. I'm a pretty efficient person, but I think we can get this right down to, to personal decisions. My wife and I go out to a restaurant, just the two of us, it's easy to spend 40 to $60 for two people. It's just easy. And then when you think, oh, you go out a few times a, a week and do that, you spend a few thousand dollars a year. Well, we have a lot of money, but I've suddenly decided I need to pay attention to my cash differently. We just, well, partly COVID made it hard to go out to eat. It's amazing how much money we saved and didn't miss it. 
right? So even somebody who thinks very efficiently about money and how do I spend my money, I suddenly thought I need to be more efficient. I think this is easier for the entrepreneur than the manager because the entrepreneur is spending her own dollar, whereas the manager is spending some nebulous investor basis dollar. Um, and that's another way I think that entrepreneurs have an advantage. It's my money I'm spending. <laughs> right. I, I have some, we have some really good questions here. Um, kind of uh, really te well teed up by your comment right now. The question is with most people working remotely or from home, how difficult are you finding to connect with your team members? Um, and what are the, some of the tactics, some of the methodologies you're taking to make a personal connection and do employee development, which um, I'll, I'll tweak that to incorporate another question that is come along, which is, and I think, so first of all, Maria, I'd love your perspective on that. And then Gre uh, Greg, I'd love to you to add, and then a question came in around individuals investment in themselves for personal development. Right, so I think, and I think that that's a point that I want to, I want to make in this call. One of the biggest things that I'm hearing that's surprising to me in this environment is how leaders are rising up and taking accountability and pushing direction, but there's an important element of self importance and self investment that you have to make. That's not going to get paid for, and it's not going to be expected by your employer. Um, it takes two uh, to to have a, that relationship. But Maria, just curious from a setting perspective in your company and based on what you're talking to other founders, what are you hearing people do? And, you know, we definitely haven't got it all figured out and we're still learning uh, in, in honesty. But, you know, what's very interesting is that um, as we survey our team, they feel much more up to date and communicated to now than they ever did before, which is kind of crazy. Um, and, um, but, but I guess here's, here's this, a few things. One is I used to travel all the time. So I was on, on, on the plane the whole time. Now I have all this extra time to be speaking with my guys. And so suddenly I am there all over and um, continuously. And so that's, that, that has given genuinely, we, weeks back every month uh, just of sheer time to speak to them um, we have a daily all team call some people might think it's excessive but we have it religiously every single day and then on mondays and friday we that normally that call is 15 minutes we just go through essentially a scrum you know a daily scrum and then twice a week we have as it's extended to half an hour where it's essentially the guys can raise anything you worry they're worried about any question they want to ask me so twice a week we speak for half an hour and we just literally just talk about anything they're worried about anything at all it may be um you know a particular project or it could be you know some, what's going to happen to our offices, whatever that may, may be. So we religiously speak every single day with extended time twice a week. And then we have a weekly virtual coffee where we just all sit down together and we do nothing but laugh together and just exchange, you know, really silly things, talk about games and stuff like that for half an hour every week. We never used to do that. You know, I'm really bad. I am generally an efficiency driven person and I see everything as, you know, time, Per, you know output and I never used to invest enough time I think in in, in that and now uh, we're forced forced to I really think it was worth it in some ways I'm grateful for this um, so that's and I'm seeing most of the founders the, a lot of founders who speak with every single person every single day you know yeah. that's pretty awesome I and haven't been able to do that that's really but it, it, it shows a lot of commitment. Absolutely. Mm, and it's yeah. interesting. We talk about these times. I'll, I'll use a personal story. But my daughter is 17. Uh, she's stuck at home with us. And I didn't realize that she her release of stress came in baking. And I'm not Amazing. much of a sweets guy. But I, I think that trying to find ways to connect with the humans on your team, the people, the, the humanity in them and finding out yeah. what are you doing? You might find you share a hobby and can do something together. So um, there's obviously the importance of being, having, creating limits and creating a space for you to be with that, with your family. But I think that to your point on, on smaller teams, it's really critical to build that human connection and relationship. Mm -hmm. Greg, um, can you talk a little bit about investment in, in, in personal development and how, you advise your, your, your companies to think about it from a planning perspective, but then also check themselves and consistently make sure that they're doing it with their employees. Yeah, so what I, that's a great question. And what I've seen is that really great players, and I mean, whether it's an athlete or a business figure, is 
they're always investing in themselves. Um, and they do it in a variety of formal and informal ways. And even in this environment, like I was on a call with uh, 1,400 members of the Young Presidents Organization last week that I gave the keynote for, they were people who wanted to continue to invest in themselves as they're running their businesses. Um, so I find that the best people are doing it. They're doing it through uh, learning new things, by getting out and networking, by taking classes at Booth. I'll put a plug in for executive education or the MBA or other good schools. Um, one of the things that sets leaders apart from many other people is a phrase that says, leaders are readers. And they actually read a lot of books and a lot of newsletters and things like that. But I think that's a way of saying people who are leaders are continually improving themselves through informal networks, formal networks. And you know what? Most people, when they finish formal education, really don't learn very much after that. When I was a 25-year-old and I had finished at Harvard, I met this 60-year-old guy and he said to me, I said, what do you do? And he says, I learn one new thing a year. And my face was like so bored, you know. He said, that doesn't sound exciting when you're 25. But he said, most people don't learn another new thing the rest of their life after graduate school. If you learn one new thing a year, you'll have learned 35 things by the time you're my age. And, um, you know, I like, th I, to give a plug to Stanford, there's a guy out there called B.J. Fogg who has a book, Tiny Habits. And I really think you should read his book, Tiny Habits. But to me, the tiny habit is I learn one new thing every year. And I find a lot of leaders are that way. Right now, in the middle of COVID, I decided to learn how to do the programming language Ruby. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's not emotional to me, dealing with all the emotional stuff, learning a programming language. I also want to put in a plug for the people I've mentioned before, Basecamp. Jason Fried and, and David Heinemeyer Hansen have some fabulous books on working remote. Uh, they've been doing it for 20 years. I think there's some of the masters in this. So you could read their book, um, but also just Google them. They've got some fabulous webinars that are now out. Um, I, I'm, you can tell I'm kind of an extrovert. I like people. And I love having my students in my office. And I was really mourning that I couldn't get physically close to my students. Something Maria said, I've had more interaction with my students this term than I've ever had in an in-person term. Um, I have touched more students. We've had more Zoom calls. We've had more... FaceTime calls, uh, more email exchanges. I think it's an issue in attitude. If, if you want to you develop yourself, if you want to connect to your people, I think this is a great time. I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, me too, uh, Greg. I couldn't agree with you more on that topic, especially given that, um, you know, I've sat on booth Zoom meetings or Zoom get-togethers, hangouts, um, Georgetown where I went for undergrad. Um, there are subgroups that I just have cons consistent wine tastings. So, I mean, I've been able to reconnect with people that I haven't talked to in over 20 years. And a lot of that is because I have the time, you know, I am forced, not forced, but I think that the lesson I take away is I have to plan for that time in the future when we turn back on and I have to go travel. Yeah. But then also the interest, I genuinely, it just makes you, because you're dealing with anxiety and, 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 and loss and you see that, it makes you appreciate those relationships. Um, I've got a couple more, a few more questions here. Um, one is, is a, a quick one. Can you work for a company and become an entrepreneur at the same time? It happens all the time. In fact, the most likely uh, colleague of mine at Booth, Jim Schrager, is the founding editor of the Journal of Private Equity. He commissioned a study on right age for an entrepreneur to start. It's not 20, except in some consumer apps. It's 35 to 45 when you've got deep industry experience and you're starting to work in a company. The one thing I'd say about that that's very important is your company owns your mind in most cases. Right. One, from a legal perspective, you need to really be sure you understand your employment contract. And from a moral perspective, if your employer has been paying you and it's an idea that comes out of your employment, you need to offer the idea to your employer first. But usually the employer doesn't want it, and you can spin out with complete legal and moral thing. It's a great way to start a business, is to start little, 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 and then say, oh, I can actually make more money from this than my corporate job, or more satisfaction even if it's not more money. Maria, does that sound familiar? 
Um, we officially launched Aina after I left, uh, but I think it's definitely it's definitely the best time to um, observe the real issues. You know, there's nothing like observing real life um, to get those real ideas. So I would agree with that very much. Yeah. Great. Um, hard question here. How does a founder CEO defend their central position at the time at the company in times of volatility and uncertainty when the business is struggling to keep its head above the water? You know, this is a, an interesting question. I d don't look at it like that at all. Like I don't, I don't know that we necessarily need a central position. Um, I think that whoever is in the center of things at this moment in time, so like when we are releasing something really new, exciting, it should be our uh, chief scientist or technology officer. And then sometimes our biggest star of the day is our support team when, you know, they pull off a really amazing uh, victory. So I'm not sure I, uh, we necessarily need to, I think, Honestly, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Greg, tell me from the scientific perspective, I never really saw it as a, something that was required. I guess, I don't know. What do you think? Am I completely, am I being naive? <laughs> no, so, no you're, des you're describing the life of an entrepreneur and, and, and the entrepreneur is a true general manager. And a general manager knows she can't do everything. She defers to her team on the areas of expertise. Yeah. Here, here's the job of the CEO and the general manager make people productive. If you all day long think, how do I make my people productive by generating capital to them, other team members, other resources, um, you don't have to be drowning. And, and it sounds like you're really good at thinking about building your team and making them productive. I, I, but Greg, so then let me challenge that a little bit because we've got another question that's related to that. How do you overcome the challenge of being a passionate entrepreneur, doing what you want as a mindset, Mm -hmm. pursuing your pursuing your passion your love versus a manager for an expanding team having more complicated issues like hr building culture executing on long-term strategies how do you Look, how think, do you how do i you think being an entrepreneur that? is the coolest thing in the universe it's the most brutal because you've got to you've got to do everything you know an entrepreneur does a manager can delegate everything an entrepreneur delegates and gets rolls up her sleeves and jumps in and does uh, we have this myth of the entrepreneur and the cool one who gets their picture on the, you know, on the front of a, of a magazine. There's just a lot of great entrepreneurs you'll never hear about who are just, they're just hardworking. They're, they're, it's just like being a parent, right? I mean, like you, you, you figure out your daughter when she was five, now she's 17. Same girl, very different human. And you, you have to keep adapting as a parent. You're never going to get it all right. You just keep saying, I love you. I'm sorry. You know, let's work. I think entrepreneurship is the, for those who have the stomach for it and the risk tolerance, it's the coolest thing in the universe. I just, and by the way, I think the entrepreneurs are the heroes of the next wave. You know, the first heroes were the frontline workers, the first responders, the healthcare people, the teachers who just, it's unbelievable to me what the elementary and grammar school and stuff teachers did in the last part, the parents, the heroes of the next wave are business people, and especially entrepreneurs who are going to create new opportunities. Out of every disaster, some of the greatest businesses are built. I'm really bullish on the next few years. I just want to inspire people like Maria, who's doing it, and you, Randy, and say, go fast. We'll give you the resources, you know, blessings on you. You are the heroes of, of the apocalypse, you know, because you, you create jobs. Right. Well, Greg, I, 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 it's, you know, I gotta say that is, I think probably the best way for you to, to end the conversation on your comments, because I think that um, it's such an optimistic approach and most importantly, consistent with, with what we believe has been a theme through our conversation here today. Um, thanks for that. Maria, I guess any parting words to your fellow um, Booth alums and the Booth Network around the world as, um, as we get through these times. I think the, the last question was really brilliant in the sense that I think that there is no real conflict. I think the passion and the love for what you do will see you through those HR and other ch and strategy challenges because at the end of the day, that's what will guide you, you know? Um, 
because you know what's right. You just know it. So there isn't real, not real conflict. Uh, so just trust your gut. Um, and for Booth, you know, stay in touch. You know, we have an amazing network. It's incredibly powerful. Um, networks have never been more important uh, than now. And I think it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's time to be reconnecting with your community. So thank you so much for being with us today. Well, I, I'm really excited. I've made two new friends in this process, Greg and Maria, <laughs> um, and the folks across the world. You know, first of all, I echo the reaching out and the network. This is your tribe. We are here to help each other. Um, we can help each other get through this if we don't know the answers. Definitely. I'm pretty sure we know somebody that does. Uh, I want to thank Cerise and Ali. They did a tremendous job helping make this easy for us. Um, and to all of you that showed up today, we really appreciate the opportunity to engage. Um, you know, we're going to send out some follow-up materials because there were so many great nuggets uh, from this conversation that I think are worth sharing with, uh, with those that could make it and those that could not. Um, but we continue to encourage you uh, to stay posted to and, 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 and join webinars at the University of Chicago, Booth, um, and Polsky Center are organizing. I know FinTechs as well. It's been a really, really uh, outstanding experience collaborating with you guys. And Greg and Maria, thanks for making this easy. I just had to um, pose the questions. You guys made the conversation uh, really, really interesting and dynamic. So much appreciated. Thanks everyone Thank for you, joining us today. Thank you, Thanks, Thank, you, Thank you, guys. All the best. Stay well. Stay healthy. Same.